Hello, and welcome to the Catching the Octopus podcast. Here, we will explore how connecting inward gives us an advantage outward. We openly talk about the obstacles and challenges and difficulties that life throws our way and how they become moments of gratitude and things that can benefit us when we look back on our lives. I'm your host, Naomi Hurley, and it is my mission to bring you top quality guests that will share with you openly their obstacles and also the techniques they use to go inward that strengthens the way that they serve themselves and others at the highest level. Thank you for joining. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. Today we have David Watson joining us for an interview. Now he's a director, a speaker and a coach and as a high performance leadership specialist, his mission is to ignite transformative change. Hopefully I can speak in this episode and in, let's start again actually. (laughs) You've got a fantastic uh, radio podcast voice by the way. Oh, thank you. Really good. Um, well, I don't mind making errors, but at the start, like that one just threw me and I'm like, ah, oh, I have to yeah. start again. But I, I like to have those little errors in it because it makes it a little bit more real. 100%. Know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, let's go again. Hello and welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. Today we have David Watson joining us for an interview. Now he's a director and a speaker and a coach and as a high performance leadership specialist, his mission is to ignite transformative change in both personal and professional realms by empowering individuals to embrace their true capabilities, which I just think is awesome. So welcome, David. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. So for our listeners who don't know you, could you give us a little bit of a background about who you are and what you do? Yeah, definitely. So um, David Watson, we specialize in high performance leadership. Um, Everything we do is very much underpinned by neuroscience leadership, but we don't tell people that because it can scare a lot of people off. So, and that really, if I can wind the clock back, maybe five or six years where I was an operational leader big corporate mining for a long time and just really started asking some questions about myself as in, why do I do this? Why don't I do that? Why do I respond like that? Why do I get caught up in this? And that naturally led me to our workplace psychologist. Yep. And I started asking him some great questions as in, you know, why am I like this? And he goes, you need to understand how your brain works. Go study neuroscience leadership. And I'm like, neuro, what, what? (laughs) And he goes, trust me, I'll send you through the link. Go do it. So that was two years of my life, a lot of money, but without a doubt changed my life forever because it put everything that was happening in my professional um, professional and personal life into perspective based on what my brain was wanting me to do and and why I was doing it based off its organizational principles, which I won't dive into because it's scary. But that really started this journey of discovery on self, but then this fire to share with anyone I possibly could because it helped me understand myself, it helped me lead myself and understand others and lead others. And I even had this epiphany where I realized I've only got so many days left in my life to live and I can only share this with so many people. Mm. Hence, left Big Mining Corporate, loved it, learned so much started our company. Our passion is to inspire change in people's personal, professional lives, to unleash their full potential. And I'm so happy I get to do that every day. Hence yeah. being here with you and yeah. loving every second of it. And it's like, a, it's a real gift, isn't it? To be able to share these things and just have people like that little moment, even if it's just one of an aha moment for them, yes. it's just like, it's heart filling. Oh, we, Without a doubt, you've nailed it. And my journey has come a long way. And what I mean by that is that when you have such a passion for something, you want to tell the world, right? Mm. And when the world doesn't pick up on it like you do, you can sort of go, am I doing something wrong? Like, what's happening? I've let this person down. But as you mature, your passion still grows. 
but you also have the perspective it's not for everyone. Yeah. So if I do a workshop with, say, 50 people and I really connect with one or two, I've won. Without a doubt, I've won. And if I can change someone's life forever based off a little golden nugget I gave them, mm. I leave there knowing that I have lived my purpose in life and that will then fuel me to keep giving back time and time again. Yeah. And I love how you said that not everything's for everyone. And and this was something that I had actual difficulty with when I first started my business. So I'd even hold back on my gifts and my skills because I didn't want to scare anyone away. But yeah. by doing that, I wasn't attracting the people that needed me either, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the way we, I'll tell you a funny story about my, my wife and I and my kids, but the way we look at leadership is, is understanding and leading self to lead others, right? That's what leadership is. And it's not yeah. just professional it's in your personal life, right? Whether that be complete strangers, friends or family. So when very much like yourself, you can't hold it in. So yeah. we might have a barbecue or a few friends come over and it just naturally starts talking about the brain and change and all this type of stuff. And my wife's like, what are you doing? Like, we want to have these friends for a long time. We don't want to scare <laughs> them off. And I'm like, yeah, but I just want to help. They're like, Help in moderation, darling, mm. moderation. But here's the kicker. I'm like, okay, I won't be the true version of myself, but in light of keeping friends, I will. Yes. But now my wife, who is my partner in the business, she had started studying neuroscience leadership, exactly the same advanced diploma I did. And then she was telling me this story in one of her, um, one of her little group sessions where she heard some verbal cues in one of the other students and yep. she gave him some advice on automatic negative thoughts and, and so forth. And that like motivated her. She was so pumped about that interaction. She dialed out, came running into the kitchen and she's like, you wouldn't guess it. Guess what? This happened, this happened. I gave, I gave him this advice and it was fantastic. And I'm like, it's happening to you too. <laughs> That's happening to you. See, see, yep. hard. you can't unsee it once. Once you see and you have that passion to help people, you just can't turn it on and turn it off. No. Like it's all the time. Yeah, and I think that the next step of that, and, and you probably already experienced this, is knowing when to share it, though. And so you can't turn it off. And no. so you're sitting there listening to them and you're like, oh, I could. if you were ready, I could change your life in five minutes, right? But 100%. You know, sit back. <laughs> yeah. And the, the the it's like intense self-regulation when you're in that moment mm. like to be able to sit there and hold back this like volcanic eruption of motivation passion knowledge and it's just like okay that sounds like fun yeah. where you're exactly right you've got to regulate it wait for the right moment wait for the right time yeah. deliver it in the right way and yeah exactly the same so you've spoken to us about what leadership is. Yes. What, what do you think is the most critical part of leadership? Fantastic. That's a great question. So what themes I'm seeing throughout any work that I'm doing, whether it be an executive, a supervisor, manager, whoever it is, recruitment agent, it is a lack of understanding the true version of themselves. So if we look at it, well, it's going to peel that back a little bit. So diversity is the key to success. Mm. And especially in behaviours, communication and thinking, right? And we need to be able to tap into that to take our teams and organisations to the next level. But what people don't understand is that diversity inherently introduces a lot of interpersonal risk. And diversity can introduce a lot of unproductive conflict if people don't understand what their own workplace priorities are, their motivators and stresses and so forth. So... In our high performance leadership program, we spend the first four sessions just peeling back the layers of self, understanding what people's natural lenses are on leadership and how that can become, you know, toxic, motivate some, stress others. And then we look at natural behavior and communication styles and how that can affect other people. Then we look at natural thinking preferences and how, you know, because we look at information one way, versus someone looking at another way, we've got to lean into that, not push that down. Yep. And then we link that to some really basic understanding of the mechanics of the brain. So people can start really lifting that level of self-awareness, 
emotional, intentional, and social intelligence to then start leading themselves. Because if you don't understand yourself, you can't possibly lead self. Mm -hmm. And then what do you use to understand and lead others? Mm. So that is without a doubt the most important work that I do with my clients is drilling down as hard and fast as I can into who they naturally are, yep. create a new lens, and then they can carry themselves consistent with values, beliefs, behaviours and goals to be more effective. Yeah, and and I often talk about, you know, creating curiosity and kind of you're, you're yes. creating curiosity with science, aren't you? <laughs> and then once someone starts to go, hmm, I wonder why I do this, Hopefully yeah. then it's going to invoke, invoke curiosity for, I wonder why they do this rather than exactly just- Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And, and to be honest, you, you've nailed one of the, one of the opening parts in one of our sessions is talking about egotistical leadership. So it's leadership, which is driven by egos. Mm. And a lot of people sort of step back and they cross their arms and all oh, that. So that's not me. <laughs> but then I inform them that's completely natural. Yeah. Right. But if we are lead, leading with our egos, we're measuring our team based off the expectations we have of ourselves, yep. which they will never meet. Yeah. And the question I ask them is, have you ever worked with or met someone that's exceeded your expectations of yourself? And of course, the answer is always no, right? Mm. So then I ask them, have you ever asked this question of yourself? Why doesn't my team listen? Why doesn't my team follow the plan? Why doesn't my team understand how to deliver the quality that I need? Mm -hmm. And I enlighten them. That's the egocentric driving those questions where, as you labeled it so well, it is how can I get my team to listen? Yeah. How can I get my team to understand how important following the plan is? How can I get my team to understand the quality we need to be successful? And that's where it's taking that leadership model away from self mm. and creating that team aspect. What I mean, if anyone that's listening to this, even when you just ask yourself that question, why didn't that person listen versus how can I get that person to listen? Yeah. It's big mindset, growth mindset, you know, just by simply asking the question. You know, it's a we problem. How can I get that person to understand? How can we do that versus, you know, why isn't that person doing it? You know, because if you take that person out and put another person in, odds are they're going to do the same thing because yeah. it's not them, it's you. Yeah, yeah. And and that can be really confronting for people, right? So how when you're dealing with your clients, how do yeah. you create that level of self-awareness in them without kind of triggering them to think they're inadequate? Because it's not about being inadequate. It's yeah. about leveling up, really. And I feel if if a leader is in one of our programs, I always celebrate a level of level of vulnerability for showing up. Yeah. So if a leader's got the courage to, you know what, I want to better myself, right? I'm going to go through this program, learn a bit more about myself and hopefully be better. And a lot of people go, oh, they go to those places to tick the box. Well, that's not true. The majority of my clients, I ask them straight up, yeah. have you been voluntold to be on this program mm. or are you actually interested? Because either way, I'm going to work with them. But it just gives me an understanding of where their mindset is. But yeah, yeah. when what I really enjoy doing and I feel that lands really well is to be able to be dynamic enough to twist it and pull it in a way that lands with them. So, and that's usually it's you leaning on the power of storytelling, right? So I can deliver some content, some words, some common language, but it's how can I bring that to life in a way that lands with them? Mm. And it's being able to do that on the spot to get them to sit back and go, wow you're right and i said what well, but that's okay right your ego naturally gets in the way that's okay yeah. i'm not having a go at you mine does too i ask the same questions but i don't act on my ego i act on that transformational leadership style which you pictured about seeing people for who they are not who we want them to be does that land okay Mm. Yeah. So, and I think the thing is, is understanding that all of the parts of leadership are necessary at some point. So I yes. work with some people sometimes on their emotions and, you know, anger isn't a helpful emotion, but mm. sometimes we need to use anger to get our message <laughs> across. So it's more about using all of those things as tools rather than being driven by them, isn't it? Without a doubt. 
I find when you're when you're working in a team environment, whether that be a family or large or small organization, that's where values come into play. And a lot of people think values are wishy-washy. Like I had a great conversation with the director I'm working with. And one of the questions, we had like a bit of a, a pre-work session to understand where he sort of is. And I asked, you know, do you have company values? He goes, yeah, no, we do. I said, well, what do they mean to you? Talk me through them. What? Mm. And he goes, to be honest, we just did them for an ISO audit. I said, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. And I'm glad you told me that because now I'm going to explain why it's so important because company values help people work in while well, within those values to achieve our mission and our purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So you're exactly right. Emotions drive positive engagement, positive conflict, challenging, but we have to do it in a way that's aligned with our team's values. Mm -hmm. So then we can make sure we're all aligned working to achieve that mission and that purpose for our vision. Mm. Yeah. And, and when we go back to that neuroscience space as well, I just want to touch on that because I think some people try and use neuroscience as an excuse, yeah. right? So, oh, it's my amygdala. It just goes off yeah. and it just does its own thing. But, you know, the amygdala hijack, I kind of, I want to debunk that and maybe yeah. we can do it now is yes, it exists, but only because yes. we allow it to exist. Yes. Yes. The, the interesting thing about the amygdala hijack hijack concept is I, I love it. Right. Especially when you draw a really simple model, but what a lot of people don't talk about is that the information, so when the amygdala picks up a threat, it cuts off the higher cortex. So we're not really, we don't have that ability to think through what we're about to do, yep. but you can feel it right? Yeah. because the amygdala is res um, responsible for that emotional response, that threat management and so forth. So once you give someone a visual model and explain what happens and it's always going to happen, mm. but then you can also empower them to catch it. Yeah. Yep. They've got to catch it, right? But it's also like running a marathon where to teach someone about the mechanics of the brain is pretty full on. Mm. So if someone says, okay, I'm going to go run a marathon, you don't just put your shoes on and then go for a 42K <laughs> run. The first thing is, hey, do I even have shoes, right? Yeah, where yeah. are the shoes? Oh, there's the shoes. Okay, tomorrow I'm going to step out the door. So what I like to really work on with my clients and even myself, this is the journey I went in with myself is mm. – you need to have that language, which you articulated well, the amygdala hijack. Once you've got that, you've got something to lean on. Mm. Without that language, you've got nothing, right? But now you've got the language. You understand the concept and how it works. You understand the feeling it should generate. Sweet. I'm in control. Let's do it. Now, I encourage people to observe what's happening, right? Observe yeah. it, label it, yep. then regulate it. Yeah. Because if you can't observe it, like feel it and if you can't label it you've got no hope of regulating it and then you become you're you're at the mercy of your emotions which is always going to lead to shame guilt and yep. regret and lots of poor decisions as well <laughs> and so yeah, yeah. yeah. so one, I, one of, sorry no you go I'm just getting excited. So yeah, go go. I get excited one, too. So <laughs> one one thing I find really interesting is and I like I like asking open questions and letting them get to them themselves, right? So mm -hmm. when I talk about an amygdala hijack, cortisol washes through the body, fight, flight, freeze, we do dumb stuff, yeah, which makes sense at the time, right? But then I, exp I ask them, so what happens, you know, maybe an hour after the cortisol has gone through your body? They're like, oh, well, you know, we, we realise we've made the wrong decision. I'm like, why do you think that is? And a lot we don't know. Well, once the cortisol and the amygdala has done its work, we can now actually think through our actions and reflect on our actions and then realise that wasn't in line with our values, behaviours and goals. And that's when that regret, shame and guilt kicks in mm. is once that's all washed away. And 99% of people know exactly what that feels like. Mm. Yeah, and and I use a good example with people about, um, you know, when we are you know, if we do be, do experience an amygdala hijack, you yeah. know, and that entices these emotions to come through, but we've all had experiences where we've actually controlled them in a second. So oh. the, the example I use, you know, you're really cranky, something's gone wrong. You've got lots of anger. You're, you're really responding. And then the phone rings and you pick it up and go, hello. Yeah. Right. 100%. And yeah. I say to them, the kicker though, is when you get off the phone, 
we're so programmed to go back and go, right, where was I? And you go back into yeah. anger. So yeah. it's more about, isn't it, recognizing it before the anger comes and goes, oh, like you said, oh, I can feel it. Something's going on here. I've been triggered. Yes. My, big, my amygdala is going to go off, but I'm not going to let it. I'm going to be yeah. curious. I'm going to ask it yes. what's happening and I'm going to go into that yes. instead. Yeah. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want Naomi or any of her guests featured on your podcast or as a keynote speaker at your next event, you'll find their contact details included in the show notes. If you'd like to learn more about how you can work with Naomi individually or as part of your strategy to improve leadership in your business, then review the courses, offers and services at getupandgrowconsulting.com.au. And a perfect example I give people is if you're merging in on a highway, you're driving on a highway and someone cuts you off without you even realizing what's happening. What's your brain telling you? Start toot the horn, get upset, grab the steering wheel, run them off the road. Yeah. Now, yeah. Do we think that's logical and rational? They're like, no, of course it's not. And if you actually did that, what would happen? Well, we'd, we'd get in a lot of trouble. Hmm. So you've regulated yourself from running into that person's car. So you're actually doing it. Yeah. You don't have the common language to be able to anchor that to it. Yeah. So you, you're just like, oh, I just didn't hit the car. I wanted to, but I didn't. Where now you can go, wow, there's that amygdala hijack. Wow, there's that cortisol. Wow, there's those deceptive brain messages. And now I'm taking control. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, like I said before, people – think that going into this um, leadership space and learning more is because they're inadequate, but I don't think anyone's inadequate. It's just about leveling up. It's just about becoming better. It doesn't mean that we weren't good in the first place. It just means that there's other steps to take. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something I actually talk to the majority of my clients or students with is I tell them this isn't an intervention. Mm. Like your leader has not requested you to be on this training because you are at rock bottom. Your leader wants to take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. And your leader appreciates that modern day leadership is tapping into neuroscience. It's not relying on the old school methods. It is you understanding yourself, understanding, you know, what motivates you, understanding the brain. How does that work so I can be a better person yeah. in or out of work? Yeah. No, most definitely. And I, um, the leadership program I put together is called the Ripple Effect Leadership yeah. Psychology Program, right? So it goes into those psychologies and we look at things like priming and, yeah. you know, and biases and all that stuff that's yes. in that the brain just automatically responds from in an attempt to just showcase people that 95% of what you do think and feel and behave, mm. you know, do think and feel, yeah, in a yeah. day, isn't really under your control if you don't have no. a sense of it, right? It's just exactly program. right. Yeah. And Ivan, um, it's, it's interesting uh, you, you say that about the, the feeling, right? So the great thing is with neuroscience, and people are scared of it. Hmm. That's okay. Yeah. We can create a common language. But everything that you work through, everything I work through with my clients, they feel it. Yeah. They just can't describe it. Mm -hmm. because you know we all have brains every brain is different right but that's okay but by giving them that scaffold or whatever you want to call it that language that enables them to actually understand themselves even more rather mm -hmm. than just being at the mercy of that feeling or that emotion or whatever's happening with their body where they can't even describe what's going on yeah yeah and and then it allows them to support other people right because they then start yeah. getting that sixth sense or that ability to yeah. see more things and go oh they're going through that thing okay how can i support them rather than them letting it trigger them to go back into the bad responses yeah and one of the things we really encourage um the people that we work with is speed of implementation which is a saying i got from one of my coaches is that when you learn something new the brain's not going to like it because mm -hmm. it means it's going to push it into a new space. But if you implement that fast, your brain will thank you, give you some dopamine, and all of a sudden that becomes a new habit, new behavior you start implementing over time, and yeah. it just becomes the way you work or live. And you've dropped that old behavior and habit, which was just natural anyway, mm. and now you've become an even more effective team member, leader, or member of society. 
Yeah. And, and do you find though, even though we've got the neuroplasticity, obviously we rewire the brain, we've got these yeah. new behaviors, feelings and, and um, thoughts that are coming through, but every now and again, it's kind of like, there's this thing that comes from left field to test us and go, is that yeah. really how you behave now? Isn't it? Yeah. And so sometimes we do slip up, which is fine. Yeah. As long as we're dusting ourselves off and, and getting back into it. I, I do exactly the same thing with my clients. Like I, I let them know with a level of vulnerability that I'm not perfect, right? Mm, mm. The brain is a supercomputer. It's like the most powerful processing machine in the universe. Mm. Like you're at the mercy of it 24-7. It's okay if you give in. Yeah. It's okay if you smell a bit of toast and you put peanut butter on it and eat it, right? Yeah, yeah. That's okay, but you want to be in control of it in the majority of the time, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And peanut butter on toast. And oh, the reason I say peanut butter on toast is during the advanced diploma of neuroscience leadership, they make you go test it, be your own scientist of your own experience. Yes. Started talking about these deceptive messages where my brain is constantly seeking reward, even when I don't need it, right? Yeah. So I will smell toast with a bit of peanut butter on it. I'm like, my brain's like, man, you're in. Whole loaf, whole jar, smash yeah. it, even after dinner. And that's when I really started to observe in myself, listen, I don't need that, but wow, that's powerful. Yeah. And it's just why. I, I always used to ask myself why. Like, why do I want that so much? Mm. Then having that scaffold or that common language of neuroscience helped me peel that apart. And it's like, well, hang on, I understand my brain is constantly seeking reward to keep me alive. That's okay. But I don't need this reward right now. Yeah. So what have I then got to do to stay in control? Mm. And then you start understanding the tools that you can put in place and you can regulate through it and call it out and label it. And then you're distracted and you're back in control. Yeah, get that pattern interrupt happening so you can go to that next space, right? Yeah, exactly right, yeah. So I have a few questions that I ask all my guests and I love that we've already talked about going inward because that's kind yeah. of, and that self-reflection, because I, I believe that's a real big strength for leaders to do. So my first question is, what's sort of the biggest obstacle you've had to overcome and how did that strengthen your connection inward and that self-awareness? The, the biggest struggle that I've had in my working experience, professional life is being a person or being a leader that has genuine care for people and believing in people and acknowledging that people are the most critical part to a successful team, mm. um, especially big corporate mining, right, which is full of very, I'm going to say left mode thinkers, not that that's the, the correct term to use, but mm -hmm. very driven on process, KPIs, metrics. And I appreciate them, right? I appreciate them now. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. But when you are a, say, a lone soldier, you go through a lot of soul searching mm. because without that level of, um, without that understanding of self, which I have now, I always thought to myself, well, should I be what they want me to be? Mm-hmm. But then you've got this this soul soulful pull between giving in to what everyone else is doing or holding true to what your values are. And I think that that fight is what really builds character, builds resilience, burns you out, rebuilds you like a phoenix. But mm -hmm. when you come out on top and realise that that is your purpose, that's what energises you, that's what you need to do forever – it gives you complete certainty that you are doing the right work yeah. and you have faith in that certainty to keep giving back, keep serving others without the expectation of anything in return. So that was a, probably a pretty long-winded answer. No, but love that. What, one of the things I even spoke about it on the Leadership 30 is that if you're going to be a people leader, let's say, a real, not saying a real leader, but a people leader, you, you've got to get ready to be lonely. Yeah. And why that is, is because if you really have genuine care for your team, you're going to do things that people don't like and people yep. disagree with, but that's okay mm -hmm. because your purpose is to help them be the best versions of themselves, whether they can see that in them or not, you don't have to worry about, right? Because you've got that pure purpose of helping them. And that's what really carried me through and keeps carrying me through. And that just keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter. So if you do get those knockers and those people say that you don't want to talk about it, rubbish, who would do that? 
you, you just take that as a level of ignorance, right? That's okay, right? Yeah, Hate yeah. comes from a lack of understanding. Like, yep. Sweet, that's you. You do you. I do me. And that's what makes the world a beautiful place. Yeah, and and leadership, you know, some people don't realise it's, it's very similar to parenting a lot of the time is you can't be friends with your kids. You need to parent your kids. So yes. you have friendships, but you can't be friends to them. You need to guide them and mm. have that overarching. And I think that's where a lot of leaders sometimes make a mistake because yes. if we look at Stephen Covey, Seek First to Understand, yeah. people automatically think, oh, I need to be friends with them. I need to go drinking with them. I need to do yes. this. Whereas it's more about, no, what you're saying, you need to understand them. What makes them tick? Yeah. What is their neuro wiring? Yeah. That's yeah. What understand. Yeah. And just on that, I had a great conversation with my 12 year old daughter in the kitchen last night where mm -hmm. I said to her, you are not going to agree with my parenting style a hundred percent of the time, but that's okay. Because my purpose as a parent is to set you up to be the most successful person you can possibly be. Yeah. And that is yeah. my responsibility. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing with that purpose. Even if it makes me upset, yes. it makes you upset because I want you to live a life where you get to the point where you look back and go, Thank you, Dad, for not giving in. Because mm -hmm. parenting, like leadership, is not easy, no. right? But if you have that purpose and you have that clear purpose, that clear understanding, that's how you lead, whether it be a stranger, a family member, someone at work, and that gives you peace that you're doing the right work with the right people to get the right result. Yeah. And, and I often talk about um, me, we and community level thinking, right? So normally people at that base level are in me thinking, it's all about me. What can I get? Yeah. And as we move up, we can go into we thinking, which is, you know, thinking about us and the team, but community level thinking is that overarching of what is the best outcome? Not what makes me feel good, not what makes you feel good, but what's the best outcome yeah. here and how do we achieve that? Yeah. Fully agree. And we spoke before about values and lack of understanding of values and purpose and mission statement. And I think that's the work a lot of teams and families have to do mm. is understand where they actually want to be in life. Mm. Like if you're a team trying to achieve success, like what does that even look like? Because if you don't have that, how are you making decisions? Like how are you building a culture? Like how are you even existing? And then what happens is you get all these little micro cultures where people think they're doing the right work at the right time, but in fact, they're not. Mm. And that creates a level of uncertainty for everyone around them because you've got three or four leaders doing completely different things, saying completely different things, but we're all in the same uniform. Yeah. And that's like my wife and I, we talk about it all, all the time where we just got to hold strong with a united front with that purpose to make the girls as successful as we possibly can, where that's our value, right? Family growth and security. Like without that, yeah. Like it's just chaos. Mm. Yeah. No. And chaos has got its own. That's a whole podcast yeah. in itself, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so another question for you. Um, I also believe that we're, the challenges we experience in life, although at the time might feel too overwhelming and really yucky, um, can actually end up being things to be grateful for, right? They can shape us, they can mold us, they can give us opportunities we wouldn't normally have. So have you had a main challenge you've experienced in your life that you look back on now that you can go, oh, I'm grateful for that? To be I want to open up on why challenging yourself is so important because I think that's really helped me appreciate tough times in life. Yeah. And what I always encourage people is that you've you've got to lean into uncomfortable, sorry, un uncomfortable situations. You've you've really got to embrace that because if you think supercomputer right, you've got to retrain your brain to be comfortable in that situation. So if you push yourself or experience that level of discomfort and survive, mm. your brain actually resets its give up mechanism to realize that, hey, we're safe and we just kicked ass yeah. and now we can do a little bit more. Yeah, And then that little bit more will come with a level of being uncomfortable and a level of challenge, but you know you can do that and you break through it again. It resets that, that limiting again and then you go again and you're... And that's the crazy thing. Like, look at exercising, right? Mm. Your brain does everything you possibly can to avoid, stop it, don't do it. Yeah. But then when you actually do your little run or whatever it is, your brain's like, yeah, we did it. <laughs> so counterintuitive. So where I'm trying to get at is that 
I wouldn't change anything in my life mm. because everything in my life has got me to this point now. And that's how I reflect on it is that if I didn't go through what I went through, whether it's personal, professional, it wouldn't have forged me to be sitting here having an amazing conversation with you. Mm. And that's why I encourage people like you need to embrace that uncomfort to forge the best version of yourself. It's going to be tough, but that's okay. Your brain needs to get used to that Mm-hmm. reset its give up mechanisms to create the new version of you. Mm, I, I love that. And I, I've had um, a bit of a challenging year myself and I explained it to um, some friends of mine is at the time when the emotions were there and the event was happening, it was like, I feel like I've just been covered in shit, but yes. there's going to be a time where I'm going to feel, Oh, this is fertilizer. Right? I'm going to shift to fertilizer, but at the moment don't feel like fertilizer, but that's kind yeah. of what it is. Isn't it? Everything that we've done great or challenging, you know, beneficial or non-beneficial actually mm-hmm. has been to create who we are today. Yeah. And you look at the most successful people in the world, whatever you measure or define success in, without a doubt, they have gone through some extreme challenges in their life, Mm. which has continued to forge them into who they are. If Mm. they gave up after the first challenge, they would not be where they are today. And I'm not even talking about multi-billionaires or anything. I'm just talking about whatever you want to be successful in, whether it's a non-for-profit group, sporting club, business, whatever it is, any type of situation where people are involved Mm. is going to bring discomfort. But the more you're used to that, the more you can reappraise that and the more you can relabel that as positive growth. Mm. As you said, once you're through it, you're through it. And that's okay. You move on to the next thing. Yeah. And um, you may already have heard this one, so it might not be as impactful as I'd hope it's going to be, but um, I read this thing about WD-40, right? So um, not a lot of people realize what WD-40 stands for. Have you heard what WD stands for? No, no. So WD is water dispersant, obviously. And the 40 is the 40th attempt that actually oh, they really no. yeah i did not know that no so they could have stopped at wd39 right and we never would have yeah, had wd40 yeah. yes. <laughs> so it's a really good way to show that that persistence and keep going yeah. is er- all around us even though we don't sometimes realize it right yeah yeah and, and uh, another little analogy and i'm probably gonna get the figures wrong but blur my mind there's a there's a gentleman called stephen curry one of the the best nba players yes. in the world So he would shoot 500 shots a day, without a doubt. So if you add that up, he shot the basketball over 500,000 times to only shoot the ball a couple of thousand times in training. Mm, Yes. Yeah, Yeah, and and that's the sort of the same analogy with, as you're saying with WD-40, is that you have to be willing to put the hard hard work in, accept failure, discomfort, have faith in the process, keep pushing, dis- discipline, commitment, focus mm. to then be able to deliver when you need to deliver. Mm. And and it's that work that we do in private, right, yes. that creates how we show up outside. So yes. 39 attempts in private say, yes. <laughs> is now how 40 shows up. Yeah. And I actually spoke to, it was a client I was working with last week where we spoke about, I love bringing sports into leadership. And it's not saying sports leadership, but and, and I asked him, if you're going to play football or soccer, most people practice two, three times a week, maybe some drills at home or even golf, right? You go to the driving range, you hit a couple of thousand balls. Who practice leadership? Yeah. No one does, right? No. Everyone just attempts to do the best they can in the middle of the game. Mm-hmm. And you apply that to golfing, right? Imagine being a golfer that never practices goes to an 18 hole golf course expecting to be amazing Mm. they're going to be bitterly disappointed yeah and that's the same with leadership like curious you nailed it you've got to be curious about what that is explore it build on it work on it so when you need it in the game you're ready you Mm. know this shot you know what's going to happen you know how to chip it over the trees you know how to get on the green in two you know how to get out of the bunker where if you've never practiced that What hope have you got about actually getting out of the bunker or playing the best game possible? Yeah, and I think that's just reframing that leadership is a process to leadership is a skill and skills need to be enhanced and we make mistakes and we grow and and we don't want to be 
you know, in the middle of leadership, like in the middle of football and doing a hamstring, right? Because that's uh, not going to get us anywhere. We need to yeah. in ourselves in that space. Yeah. Well, one, one interesting element I, I work on with clients as much as I can is that, so just say you have a, a bad game of golf, right? What's the worst thing that can happen? You're a bit disappointed. You might have a broken club or two if you lost balls. Yeah. If you do leadership wrong, you can have an impact on someone's soul that they carry for the rest of their life mm-hmm. to the point where they will actually raise their children in fear of what you did or didn't do. That is the impact of not practicing and appreciating and working on leadership versus a game of golf where you just come yeah. back the next weekend and have another go. And yeah. that's where I think if you take leadership seriously, curiosity naturally comes into play and I think once you've got that curiosity how you put it that's fantastic is that that then fuels this level of asking great questions Mm -hmm. learning your team treating them the way they like to be treated like Mm -hmm. just that continuous journey on self so lead self then understand others and then lead others and and knowing that they've got the ability to you know adversely impact someone's life also then hopefully gives them the realization that, hey, I can change lives. Like if 100%. I can show up as a strong leader, and that's kind of yeah. what motivated me in the earlier days is I noticed that when I created greatness in my team, then they went home and created greatness, and that's where I come up with the ripple effect, yes. right? It just flowed yeah. right through the community. 100%. And, and that's what people don't realize about the impact that can have on people. And mm-hmm. if – it's like how people say that my amygdala high, I'm at the mercy of my emotions, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not a good leader. I'm not a people person, but I'm still, you, you can't turn that power on and off. Yeah. So if you're a person that doesn't know how to treat people, that doesn't automatically turn that power off in them. No. It's it's still there, right? Yeah. And I think that's where, you, usually when I work with my, my clients on it, I always tell them a story about the good, how someone in my life, has had that influence and changed the trajectory of my life forever. And I've been trying to hunt that person down to thank them. Mm-hmm. But then I say, imagine if that was you. Imagine if someone tapped you on the shoulder in a supermarket and said, John or Jane, you probably don't realize this, but your time as my leader was amazing, changed my life forever. I'm actually doing this and this and this all because of you. You might not even know that. I say, how would you make that feel? That'd be, yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty good. Yeah. Let's put the other hat on there. Imagine you're in the supermarket and someone taps you on the shoulder and says, the way you treated me destroyed my life forever. Mm. I shaped my kid's future around fearing people like you and I hope you rot in hell. Yeah. How would that make you feel? Yeah. You might not even know you've done it. Yep. Yep. And I've actually got a story of that. So when um, I was only 19, I was working up at um, Worsley Illumina, now South 32, near where we are. And the purchasing superintendent pulled me in and suggested I go and do the um, mature age entry to get into university. And I was straight out, I can't do that. Yeah. Um, he's like, no, no, you can't. And I said, no, not like none of my family had ever done any extra study. And he can finally convinced me. And I'm a year and a half away of finishing my master's after doing yeah. two degrees. And I'm thinking of a PhD. My 100%. life was shaped yeah. by that one conversation. And yeah. so if anyone listening to this knows Ron James, he was living in Mandra, worked at, yeah. at, at Worsley. I'd love to do just what you yeah. said there and thank him so much because now there that's inspiring my kids, right? 100%. I can do anything. If mum can do it, I can do it. Yeah. And the lens I like to have is it's those genuine acts of kindness without expecting anything in return with that overarching lens of just wanting to have a positive impact on the world. Mm. And whether that's with a stranger opening the door for someone, whether it's in your professional leadership role, non-for-profit leadership role, like if you just have that overarching mindset that I want to have a positive impact on this world, moments like you just described will happen all the time. Yeah. Wouldn't the world be a beautiful place? (laughs) Um, and one last question I have for you. So um, that whole self-awareness as well, once we start looking at the brain and once we start connecting, I really feel like it actually strengthens even our own connection with our inner self. And I feel like that actually can override the brain sometimes um, if we're there strong enough. So do you have any daily, weekly or monthly practices you do that strengthen that inner connection with self? I guess the thing I'm doing all the time 
is observing what my brain wants me to do. Yeah, I love it. And then measuring that prediction against my values, my goals, and my beliefs. So that's something that I'm doing all the time from when my alarm goes off. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get up to go to the gym at four o'clock, but then I know I want to, but I just sit and observe what my brain's trying to do and mm -hmm. even catch myself out saying things out loud, mm -hmm. which I shouldn't be saying but my brain is trying to convince me not to do it. So again, a strengthening that muscle of observing, labeling it with that new common language and just staying in control and just regulating through. I feel that is the most important thing that I do. I never leave focus on it and always ask why, like, why am I needing to do this? Why am I wanting to do this? Why is my brain wanting me to pick up my phone and scroll? Why does my brain want me to buy that shiny object? Why this? Why that? And if you can start questioning yourself why, it completely changes your perspective on what you should be doing or should not be doing or saying or not saying. Mm, yeah, no, that's great. So then if people want to reach out to you, I know you've got some programs that you do run yep. and you work a fair bit in the corporate and individual space, but what, what's yeah. the best way for people to find you? Um, definitely on our website, neurolead.net.au. I'm on Facebook. LinkedIn, just reach out. More than happy to talk. This is what I love. So if someone rings me and goes, hey, Dave, I just want to talk about leadership, bit of self-awareness, like that will give me the biggest rush of my day. I love that, right? So yeah, feel free, reach out. I work with humans. Yes. Humans work in big corporate. Humans run milk bars. Humans work in non-for-profit. Humans are stay-at-home parents. Yes. So it doesn't matter who you are, reach out. My purpose is to help people unleash their full potential, whether it's in their personal or professional life. Mm, yeah, no, bang on. And I'll put all the links to all of that yeah, um, down, down below as well into the show notes. So if anyone wants to get a hold of you, they can. So look, awesome. I loved our conversation and I think um, I was really, I, I feel like there are no accidents and the fact that, you know, Jeff Stewart's introduced me to a few yeah. podcast guests now and that you're on that Leadership 30 that I listened to. Um, yeah, I don't believe that was by chance. So thank you to whoever was helping with that. And I yeah. really appreciate you coming on and sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm incredibly humbled that you've given me the opportunity and trusted me with your podcast. This could have been an epic failure. I don't <laughs> think it was. It feels really good, but yeah. I appreciate But also your listeners for giving up their most precious resource of their time to listen in. And I hope that we've added value, maybe solved a few problems and hopefully exceeded their expectations. Hopefully. Thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. Thanks. Thanks for joining in and listening to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. It's been great having you here. And if you'd like to go and like and subscribe and maybe even leave a five-star rating if you think it's worth it, I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in our